Welcome everyone to the GAR Hall special event Zoom edition tonight with Jim Galinsky. Thank you all for joining us here. And um, first thing is we ask you to keep your mics muted all through the presentation, if you would. Um, at the end of the presentation, there will be a question and answer period. We ask if you'd like, if you're thinking of it and you don't want to forget it, put your questions in the chat area, which is at the right of your screen, and Jim will address those at the end. He's also received some via email, which he will be addressing as well. So all of our programs here are open, they're free to the public, and um, if you'd like to send in a donation, we would graciously appreciate it. As you know, everything's been closed down for COVID and we haven't been able to do any of our on-site um, open houses or any sort of fundraising. And we're anticipating, hopefully opening, possibly February 2021, but it's a long time for not having any, um, any of those wonderful donations or memberships. So if you'd like to send something, I've put the information again in the chat area. There's, you can do it via P PayPal right now while you're watching, or you can send in a check via, um, via the mail. Um, our next event is going to be the lighting of Lawson Tower, which we're going to do on the 29th, the 30th, excuse me, the 30th, the 31st, and the 1st. Um, it's going to be lit up for Halloween, and on the Friday and Saturday night, Lene Badger is going to be playing some spooky tunes on the bells. It'll be about a 45-minute concert. That'll go from 6 until 6.45, and the lights will stay up probably till 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening. Drive by, socially distance, sit on the lawn if you like, um, and just enjoy a little bit of spooky fun. The next Zoom presentation will be uh, November 5th with Christopher Daly. He'll be talking, um, his presentation is actually 1620 the first year. If you were here a month or so ago, you saw Chris did the presentation on Sacco and Vanzetti. So he's done a few things for us, so we're, we're happy to have him coming back. So now I want to start with um, I don't think he needs too much introduction. So many of you here tonight know him. Jim Glinsky, he um, is a historian and an author. He's gonna to talk to us about his new book, um, Old Oak and Buckets. So Jim, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, welcome everybody. And first I wanna thank the Institute Historical Society for running these talks, since the GAR Hall is uh, not open like everything else. I'd uh, also like to thank the Historical Society for uh, helping me publish the book. Uh, they are the official publishers. Uh, and uh, at the end of the presentation, there'll be a, a slide on how you can purchase the book, which is another way to support the Historical Society because uh, they make money on every book that gets sold. And I don't make anything, unfortunately. But um, after I finished my number one best-selling book on the history of the Situate Fire Department, People asked me what I was going to write about next. Uh, some people wanted me to actually do the police department, but uh, it was quite clear at that time that the number one priority for people in, in Situate was basically some of the issues with its water supply, especially uh, the brown water issue. Uh, so that's when I decided to investigate and uh, write about the uh, water supply in Situate. Uh, what I discovered initially is that uh, there are a lot of the same issues that have been related to the water supply in Situate over the, the decades. Uh, and part of that is because of some of the unique characteristics of Situate, uh, the fact that it's a town whose population uh, often more than doubles during the summer. So they have to have a water supply that meets the needs of a much larger population for at least three months of the year. Uh, it's unique geology, uh, somewhat unfortunate for water supply. Uh, it has, uh, as many of you know, who live in Situate, uh, clay and hard pan, uh, is, it's soil, uh, and the aquifer uh, operates in veins. So it's very difficult to discover groundwater for wells. 
uh, and much of the history of Situate's water supply is searching for groundwater uh, for good wells. Uh, also, uh, the town itself has had a tendency to be reactive to water issues instead of uh, proactive uh, throughout its history. So that's also created some of the issues that have existed over the decades. Um, I'm gonna start with uh, a slide that many people recognize down in the harbor in Situate. We hope. And uh, this is a sign talking about how Situate got its name. And it's a first connection of Situate to its water. Uh, Sadwood Brook is the brook that runs into the harbor. Uh, the Native Americans pronunciation turned into the English spelling of uh, Sadwood or CT. Sidwade I've also seen. Uh, and at this time, English authors and poets uh, generally put a silent C after S's. And so by 1640, people were referring to the town uh, as Situate. So that's the first connection to Situate. Uh, water supply, that's how it's got its name. The second connection, uh, and something that kind of exists for the next 250 years, is the old oaken bucket or plural buckets. Um, it's a poem that was written by Samuel Woodworth in 1817, uh, reminiscing about his days on the farm he grew up on in Situate and the coolness uh, of the water he got from the well, lifted up from the uh, well with the uh, well sweep on, on the side. And that's basically how Situate uh, residents were going to access their water for the next 250 years. Individual wells uh, with a well sweep. Uh, and some of those uh, are still uh, on property around the town. Uh, you can see them. Sorry about this. I actually took these photos on a bike ride uh, around town. Uh, so many, some of you may actually have these on your property, but uh, they're around town. Most of them have, most don't have the well sweeps with them, but uh, there are lots of these old wells uh, around town. Uh, we also have to kind of keep in mind at the beginning of the water supply system in the late uh, 19th century and circa 1900, that Situate is a pretty small town. Uh, mostly farmers and fishermen, a uh, little manufacturing, uh, and its total population in 1900s was 2,470. So it's a, a pretty small place around 1900 when it decides to develop a, a water system. All right, just uh, save me a lot of time here. Uh, a very simple diagram of what we're talking about when we talk about water supply distribution systems. Uh, and you can see that there's on the bottom left side there, there's gonna be a source of water. Uh, it's gonna be wells or surface water. And it's going to uh, go to a treatment plant and come out of the treatment plant to a storage tank. Uh, and then from the storage tank into water mains, uh, and then from the water mains into individual houses. It's a pretty simple system for delivering water, but it doesn't get developed until the late 19th, early 20th century. All right. So the beginning of the water system is going to really take place in the late 19th century. And once again, uh, summer residents are going to drive a lot of what this water system is going to have to do. Uh, and a lot of people also don't understand that uh, people did not go to the beach uh, and come down to Situate and in other places with beaches uh, really until the late 19th century. Uh, and when they started to come, uh, there were people who were coming from Boston or Brookline. And by that time they were living in houses uh, where they were used to actually having a water closet and water that came out of a faucet. Uh, instead of having to go to a well to get it. And uh, as the number of summer residents increased, uh, there was a clear need to provide them with some of those uh, water uh, luxuries, I guess you could call them initially, 
uh, that they were used to having uh, back in their uh, full-time homes. And developers who began to start buying up property and develop it uh, could not uh, attract more resi summer residents unless they provided them uh, with some kind of a water system. So summer residents are going to drive the development of the early water system. Uh, again, the geology and hydrology of situate uh, is also going to make it difficult to do some of this uh, development of a water supply system and create some problems as uh, we go along. There were two types of water companies in the beginning. Uh, one was spring water companies. Uh, there were two famous ones, uh, the Beaver Dam Spring Water Company, uh, and the second one was the Egypt Spring uh, Water Company. They were about a thousand uh, feet away from each other. The Beaver Dam uh, Spring Bottles, uh, Spring Water Bottling Company uh, was obviously on what today is Beaver Dam Road. Uh, at the time, I think that was Willow Street. Uh, the Egypt Water Company is on Tilden, what today is Tilden. Uh, so, two early uh, spring water companies. Why did people want to buy spring water from uh, companies in situate? Because they supposedly had some uh, curative qualities to them that helped people feel uh, that they could combat some of their diseases with it. And actually the government in a little write-up on spring uh, bottling companies kind of supported that. So it's a pretty good business. Uh, and there's a example of a bottle from the Egypt uh, uh, spring bottling company that unfortunately can't quite see the, the embossing on it. These are pretty rare. I mean, I, I think uh, Lyle Nyberg, uh, who most of you know is the situate historian, has a, a, a bottle from the uh, Beaver Dam Company. Uh, and it actually was a flavored water, vanilla. Uh, and uh, the Historic Society has uh, another bottle from the Egypt. Those are the couple that I know of. There may be a couple of others around town. If you have one in your, uh, in your house somewhere, uh, either hold on to it or uh, talk about giving it to the Situate Historical Society. So spring water bottling companies uh, were the first water companies uh, in town. The second water companies were water companies, small water companies that came into existence again to serve uh, the increasing number of summer residents and to also encourage uh, development of uh, certain areas of town, North Situate and Minot, uh, Sand Hills, the Harbor uh, and the Cliffs. And also, uh, since we tend to forget it often, Hummer Rock, especially after 1898 when it got split off uh, from the rest of Situate by the Portland Gale. Uh, in Situate uh, Harbor and in Sand Hills, there was a company, a couple companies. Uh, it's kind of hard to figure out what they call themselves. Sometimes you see them as the Situate Harbor Water Company, other times as the Situate Water Company. There's a great series of maps in the historical society, which I have a little example of off on the uh, left hand side there. Uh, in, the, in about 1890, uh, their maps of uh, pipes that they were thinking about uh, laying down to Situate Harbor. Uh, the Tory brothers in North Situate were trying to develop what today is Surfside. Uh, and they actually, excuse me, came up with a, a series of windmills uh, and just dug an open well uh, they had a couple of windmills you can see in the picture on the left, uh, and they had two 10,000 gallon tanks, uh, and they set down some pipes uh, along what today again is Surfside and the Glades, uh, again to try and provide water uh, as they develop the area for summer residents. Uh, the, the search for windmills was interesting. Uh, it's not quite clear whose windmills belong to who. And on the right-hand side, you can see a windmill in the background of the Mitchell House, which was one of the more famous and largest of the guest house, many guest houses that were uh, here in the 1890s and early 20th century for summer residents. Uh, some people think the windmill behind the Mitchell House was their own windmill that they used to provide water for 
their guest and wasn't one of these two windmills here, it's really difficult to determine that. And there were windmills in other places in situ too. Uh, some near uh, the Mitchell House on Collier Ave in, in, uh, in Minot. Uh, there were some down near the harbor. There were some on the cliff. Uh, so there were kind of windmills all over the place in the early days of water. In Hammerock, there was a company called the Crosby Water Company, named after the uh, developer who was trying to develop Hammerock. Uh, they had a well in Holly Hill in Marshfield. Uh, and Mr. Crosby apparently made his own pipes uh, and tried to develop uh, Hummerock as a summer resort area too. It was kind of a wild west atmosphere for uh, water companies in the 1890s uh, in situate. Now the real story of situate's water supply gets started when the uh, situate water company gets created in 1893. Uh, it was created by an act of the Massachusetts State Legislature. Uh, it had some of the same people who were the early developers of places uh, of water uh, in the harbor and sand hills. Uh, and residents were being asked to create a townwide water system, which would be contracted out to this situate water company. Uh, and it was uh, one that was caused quite a debate, and a lot of people in Situate expressed their opinions by writing poetry uh, in the Situate newspapers. And here's an example of, of one. I'm just going to read it quickly. Apologize for some of the uh, somewhat racist remarks at the end, but it was the 1890s. A wild North Pole explorer will do me no good. A modern fad electricity won't saw or split my wood. What care I for improvements or any modern quirks? I'll soon be with the angels. Confound the waterworks. So cries the man of ancient mind, who's well content to live and know not of the tariff, nor wants to take nor give. Not so with men of modern times, who loud progression strokes, who bathe not in a wash basin, but call for waterworks. He'll have them, they are sure to come. A rising man shall win despite the crowing chandelier, who only makes a din, let every man of growing mind who fears not Japs nor Turks put in his ballot box next March and vote for water works. So it was a pro water works poem in that case. But there were some uh, other negative ones too. Um, the company existed in 1893 and from 1893 to 1900, they were unable to sign a contract with the town. Uh, the town had cold feet. Uh, they got burned by investing in the Old Colony Railroad in the 1870s. So a lot of people in town uh, really did not want uh, to create a town-wide uh, water system. For, so for about six years, seven years, uh, the Citroen Water Company uh, did some construction, tried to dig some wells, put some pipes in, uh, they really weren't making any money. They weren't getting paid for delivering water uh, in the town. Uh, and it's no surprise they went bankrupt and sold out to a group of investors from Hingham led by a guy called John J. Moore. Now in 1901, Moore finally was able to make a contract with the town. Uh, it would be a contract with uh, terms of not less than uh, 10 years and no more than 15, uh, in which they would uh, provide water for protection against fire and for public uses. Uh, it was a close vote even then, uh, 143 to 138 in favor of signing this contract with the Situate Water Company. All right, uh, there are four things that water companies are going to do, whether it's 1901 or 2000, uh, and 20. Uh, they're going to lay pipes. They're going to search uh, for wells and hopefully find them some that uh, can produce significant amount of water. They're going to look for surface water sources and in situ it, that meant initially the old oak and bucket pond, which had been a source of drinking water since colonial days. There's some 
thought that it may in fact be the oldest continuous source of public drinking water uh, in the country. If it isn't the oldest, it's, uh, it's amongst the oldest. Uh, and they would also have water storage tanks, or as, as they're known as standpipes, uh, as we saw from that diagram. And clearly the most uh, famous one in the area, and in some ways in the whole country, is Lawson Tower. It's not illuminated for Halloween in these pictures, uh, but uh, you get the water tower before it was Lawson Tower, which was built uh, in the 1890s by the Situate, uh, initial Situate Water Company. Uh, it's 250,000 gallons, excuse me, 275. Uh, and uh, it was basically going to store the water and provide the water pressure for the initial water system. The middle picture is uh, during the construction of what became known as Lawson Tower. Thomas Lawson, the copper magnet, was building his dream wall of the state. Uh, and he and his wife just didn't really want to look over across the fields at that uh, water tower. So he sent an architect to Europe to search for or look at and draw or bring back designs for uh, all kinds of different water tower, uh, different towers in Europe. And they came back with this Romanesque design, uh, which became the famous Lawson Tower. But basically, it's a water tower. Uh, and it would function until 1988 as a standpipe or storage tank. Excuse me, let me go back that way. So, 1917, about 15 years after the contract was signed, the Citroën Water Company came to the town uh, and announced a 40% increase in water rates. And they were now going to charge the town $35 for every hydrant they put in instead of charging them zero. Uh, and the town protested, uh, went to the state, got a hearing, but the uh, state agreed with the water company uh, and they got their uh, increase. The only thing the state did uh, was tell the water company that it couldn't pay out its dividend until it completed uh, its new piping system it was working on. So in the 1920s, the Citroën Water Company is going to uh, expand uh, by building a uh, new uh, pumping station, which you can see here uh, on the bottom right. Some of you may recognize this building because it still uh, looks like that. It's uh, in the same location right on uh, the, the pond, Old Oak and Bucket Pond near the Rotary. Uh, it's now the offices for the, the water uh, department or water division. Uh, but that was a new building in 1924 and also has some pumps in it to pump water out of Old Oak and Bucket Pond. Uh, they also began to dig some wells. Uh, and this is where Webster's Meadows became a major source for a town's wells. Uh, there were several that were uh, successfully dug here. Uh, two of them are still operating today. Uh, Wells number 10 and 11 we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, so uh, they were beginning to expand the pumping station, beginning to dig some, some wells as part of the water supply to supplement the Old Oak and Bucket Pond. And if you look at the value of the company, it went up from $391,000 uh, in value in 1920 to over 660,000 in 1928. Surprisingly, in 1929, John Moore and his partners sold the Situate Water Company to some New York investors known as the Community Gas and Service Company. They also bought the Cohasset Water Company and the Hingham Water Company. Uh, so they kind of controlled water in this area in the, in the South Shore. Um, in, 19, uh, in October, Halloween actually, uh, 1930, they announced uh, another rate increase, which would take uh, place on January 1st, 1931. And they laid out the rationale for that. They had made $245,000 of improvements. Some of the things I just mentioned, the new uh, water pumping station, uh, some new wells. Uh, and they also wanted to expand the water supply to the west end of town. Uh, and they uh, were going to have their rate payers uh, 
pick up uh, the, the cost. Uh, this led to a whole series of hearings in the State House. Uh, the first one attended by over 300 people from Situate. Many Situate summer residents were fairly influential bankers uh, in town and or lawyers, uh, and they represented the town, uh, gave the town some assistance in these uh, hearings. Uh, but the decision by the state boards kept getting delayed and delayed until finally in May, uh, the decision was made uh, by the company, not by the state, that they would rescind their rate hike uh, and ask for a small increase. If the people in situ didn't want to improve the water system, uh, they weren't going to continue spending the money to fight uh, against the town. In the meantime, the town began to think about ways that it could buy the water company. And at a special town meeting in uh, June 1931, uh, by a two-thirds vote of those present, they decided to purchase the company. And in July 1931, uh, they bought the company for $742,128.48. And it would be purchased by selling bonds. Uh, and again, the, some of the bankers who were summer residents uh, negotiated uh, some pretty nice bond rates for the town uh, to finance the purchase of the system. So the town buys the water company. And now there's going to be a situate water department. The first thing they did was elect three water commissioners who are going to run and operate the uh, company. Uh, and they also hired a superintendent to run the company on a daily basis. And they made a great decision in their hire of William Lumbert to become the water superintendent. Mr. Lumbert, a 1906 graduate of MIT, had been the water superintendent in Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, he's kind of a mystery man. There were like no pictures of this guy. Uh, he wrote a lot of articles about uh, wells and uh, standpipes, and he was uh, considered an expert by his colleagues in New England and Massachusetts. Um, and we'll see, he did some great things for the water company, he basically built Situate's uh, public water supply system from 1931 to his retirement in 1952. Uh, but uh, he must have been either a very shy or a humble person because it's really uh, not a lot about him, uh, except for a couple of articles uh, that he wrote and the, the fact that he did a pretty good job developing uh, a, a water system for Situate. Pretty simple goal, uh, to supply adequate amount of potable water at a lower price uh, for the citizens of Situate. And they had a tough time initially because here they are, uh, 1931, uh, the Depression is going full steam. Uh, also, the 1930s was uh, an era of drought. The most famous is a Dust Bowl uh, out in the Midwest, but uh, New England uh, also was facing drought throughout the 1930s. Uh, but an example of William Lumbert's talent was that he used the Depression uh, to his advantage. Uh, during the Depression, the New Deal uh, created a lot of public works programs. The Works Progress Administration uh, employed 9 million men uh, during the war, mostly on public works programs, like laying pipes. Uh, so almost all of Situate's infrastructure for water was paid for by the federal government during the 1930s. It also had the advantage of employing uh, unemployed uh, citizens of Situate. Situate's uh, population, very seasonal workers, fishermen, Irish mossers, farmers, uh, and Lumbert purposely did most of the work in the fall uh, and uh, into the winter, if possible, uh, because that's when many of Situate's citizens are not working. Uh, so we provided them with jobs, and also it was before the holidays, so they got some cash uh, before Christmas. Uh, pretty good move, but the bottom line was that 
Situate had a lot of its infrastructure, water infrastructure paid for uh, by the federal government during the 1930s. So they are gonna lay pipes. Again, thanks in large part to the federal government. Uh, they're going to dig for lots of wells. Some are successful, some are not. Uh, and they are going to build uh, the biggest standpipe or water storage tank in the eastern part of the United States uh, in 1938 using, uh, again, federal money to pay uh, workers to build that. And all along, he's going to be able to reduce rates for people, which was a justification for creating uh, the town water company. Uh, so Mr. Lumbert was quite a successful superintendent. Uh, water superintendent. So here's a picture taken from an article that he wrote of uh, digging a well in situate. Uh, they don't identify which one it was. It had to be one of three wells, Bound Brook, Kent Street, or Cedar Street. Those are the wells built at this time. I suspect it's the Bound Brook well uh, because the Brook wells originally were going to be built by a Chicago company who had a strange deal that if they didn't find a well that would provide a million gallons of water per day, uh, that uh, the town didn't have to pay them anything. Well, they didn't find uh, a well that gave them a million gallons of water a day. There aren't any of those in situate, I don't think. <laughs> uh, so the town ended up buying the rights to the, the, the well field for $1,500. And Mr. Lumbert said, I can build a different kind of well, I think in Bound Brook, which is the biggest uh, watershed in Situate. Uh, so I think this is uh, the well that he was trying to build uh, in Bound Brook, uh, which is known as well number 12, uh, and was started uh, pumping water in 1933. Only problem was that the water had a lot of carbon dioxide in it, and that meant it had to be treated with lime. And it also fell short, way short of the expected uh, production. And so it wasn't used after 1938. Uh, the Kent Street well, some of you may know, it's over by the Situate Country Club. Uh, and initially it provided 400,000 gallons uh, of water a day. Uh, but soon it had issues with salt, which a lot of wells in situate uh, will have. And it had to cut its production in half and they had to shut it down in 1973, although it was later used to, uh, as one of the sources of water irrigation for the Widow's Walk Country Club. Another well uh, dug at that time was Cedar Street well number six, 1936. Uh, it was abandoned quickly because it just really didn't produce much. It wasn't worth uh, maintaining. Here's the uh, pump house in North Situate. It's right next to the playground, the new playground in North Situate. Uh, it's been maintained. I don't know, if I, it's got an address actually on the front. I don't think anybody lives there, but if you drive through North Situate, uh, you can see that next to the, the playground. Um, and next to that is the Manlot water storage tank or standpipe. Again, the biggest one in the eastern part of the United States. It's also now today known as the Creelman uh, standpipe uh, because they built a development there in the 50s or 60s. Uh, you can't see the Manlot uh, standpipe anymore from the street. You have to go basically right up to it. That's why you can never get a good picture of it anymore uh, because it's just surrounded by, by houses. Uh, and to get access to it, you know, the town actually has to uh, get permission from uh, residents to go through their property to get to the uh, standpipe. Okay. All right, by 1940, uh, the town was pumping 180 million gallons of, of of water. Uh, and you can see the breakdown by wells, the Webster uh, Meadow Wells 11 and 14, 15, 16 producing uh, the most water. Uh, again, the Webster uh, wells are off of 123 uh, across from uh, there's a garden center, I forget the name of it, 
uh, there and next to the, on the other side of the uh, blueberry uh, orchards. Uh, still in existence, been pumping water for the town since uh, 1931. Kent Street Well was next, uh, and then another uh, Webster's Meadow. And by this time, the old oaken bucket pond was not being used for water. Uh, another move by Mr. Lumbert. Uh, it was expensive to use old oaken bucket pond water. They had to treat it with lots of chemicals. So his policy was not to use water from old uh, oaken bucket pond, but to depend on the groundwater from the, the wells to supply water to the town. And by this time also, uh, the Baumbrook well we talked about was not being used any longer. All right, Hummer Rock, the outlier. Uh, this is a map of one of two big developments uh, in Hummer Rock in 1940. The problem was there was no water supply. Uh, there was the former Hummer Rock uh, Water Company of Mr. Crosby. Uh, there was a curious contract that he signed later on that the town uh, water company actually, if they wanted to, uh, could take over uh, the water supply system uh, in Hummerock, which is one of the things they did almost immediately after purchasing uh, the Situate Water Company in the 1930s. But uh, they didn't expand the water system in uh, Hummerock very much until these developers come along. Uh, and they're talking, as you can see here, about building hundreds of houses. Uh, this is the one near the, uh, what well, was then naval base, now it's the Air Force. There was uh, no Air Force before World War II. Uh, so, uh, fortunately for the town, the Navy was going to front the cost uh, for laying thousands of feet of water pipe. And in the southern part of Hammer Rock, uh, the developer decided to uh, fund the water uh, system. So, the town got uh, a new water system. Uh, for Hummer Rock, uh, free of cost uh, in the 1940, early 1940s. The only problem was they had to buy the water from Marshfield because there was no water source uh, in the Situate part of Hummer Rock. Uh, and that's still the case today. Uh, Situate buys water from Marshfield for Hummer Rock. Okay, so. Not using old oak and pond, we're depending on wells, uh, and we're developing areas like Hummer Rock during Mr. Lumbert's uh, tenure, along with building the biggest standpipe in the eastern part of the country. Uh, World War II, I don't have a slide for it because it's pretty simple. Basically, World War II puts an end to the New Deal and the public works programs. Everybody's concentrating the war effort. Uh, and the workers, the young men in situated, are either uh, going to be uh, in the service, service, or they're going to be working in war-related uh, industries. Maybe they're going to be working at the Ingham or Quincy shipyards, who knows. Uh, but they're not laying pipe in the building uh, water storage towers. So everything's kind of on hold. It's just a period uh, of maintenance, except they continue to look for uh, wells. Uh, they always will be. Uh, and there's a huge drought in 1944. And the town uh, is precariously low on, on water. Uh, but luckily, in the end of the year, they find a new well source in what's called Stern's Meadow. And they're going to uh, build well number 17, which is we'll get to is still in the news today, actually. Uh, it was a very productive well, 400,000 gallons of water per day it was able to produce. Uh, because of the drought, they actually had to, at one point in time, uh, they couldn't wait for it to be completely finished. They actually uh, had the fire department running hoses from the well into the old oaken bucket pond uh, to supply some water uh, during this drought. They also talked about possibly getting water from Norwell and came up with this kind of cockamamie scheme to, when Norwell refused, to 
get water from Hanover, which they would pipe run pipes through Norwell uh, to come to Situate. And along the way, they would sell that water to Norwell if they wanted to, but neither one of those uh, happened. All right, major change is gonna happen uh, in Situate after World War II. It's gonna go from being a small uh, town with some uh, summer residents, uh, increasing the population during the summer uh, to a suburban town, which is growing like many suburban towns after World War II very rapidly, thanks to the baby boom and uh, the post-World War II era. In 1940, Situate had 4,000 residents. In 1960, it's gonna have 11,000 residents. Uh, in 1949, there were 5,000 residents in Situate. In the summer, there were 30,000. So the population increased sixfold. Uh, so the water system had to provide water, not for the just the 5,000 uh, year round residents, but for 30,000 people uh, who were there for the three months uh, in the summer. So once again, uh, they're going to look for ways to increase uh, the water supply. And they looked to Norwell once again. And once again, Norwell, uh, not very cooperative, uh, is not going to provide Situate uh, with water. Probably would have solved the whole problem. They're talking about an additional million gallons uh, a day uh, if they could hook up with Norwell. The Metropolitan District Commission, which runs the Quabbin Reservoir, uh, was talking about creating some distribution reservoirs in the Blue Hills uh, in Milton, which they eventually did. And so Situate was investigating. Uh, being able to hook up with that. That was clearly uh, either going to take a long time to happen uh, or wasn't going to happen at all, which was the final uh, result there. So once again, they got a search for wells. So they got lucky in 1949. Uh, the Boston Sand and Gravel property, uh, they discovered a uh, very good well there, uh, got very good terms from the Boston Sand and Gravel Company. Uh, and it came just in time because uh, another drought hit situated in 1949 uh, with a 17-inch deficiency in water that year. So they found one well, but they've got a problem with this, this drought. They were kind of getting frustrated, and uh, in one time report, they kind of uh, made the statement that uh, we're just searching and searching for wells. We're just not finding any. we got to kind of face up to that fact and try and figure out another way to supply water. However, uh, they did decide to continue looking for wells, and this time they were going to hire a seismologist uh, to try and find at least places uh, that had potential water, and if not anything more, just eliminate places uh, where there wasn't going to be water so the town wouldn't have to keep digging uh, the over 100 test wells. Uh, that they were doing to try and find uh, a better well. Uh, it happened to be a Jesuit uh, priest who uh, was in, in charge of this. Uh, and he actually came up uh, with uh, four or five uh, new wells using the seismologist techniques. Uh, some of you might recognize these. So there's not the Fitz Mills well was one of them. There was one in Wagner's Meadow, which is now underwater because it becomes part of the reservoir. Uh, there's one that's still functioning on an old Forge Road, uh, as well as uh, one where the old Boston Edison Company used to be. It's on the corner of uh, 3A and First Parish Road, which is still a very productive well. The other thing that was beginning to happen is the situate was rapidly developing. Uh, there were over 200 new houses being built each year. And in the 1952 town report, the water department is complaining that the town boards are approving new housing without a water supply. And they can't keep up <laughs> with the number of houses that are being built in the town. Uh, that the town other boards are, are, are approving. It should sound somewhat familiar to some of us in recent years. Um, and this is really when Situate 
has what I call a, a very fragile water system. Uh, it's kind of just always running to catch up uh, to things, to be, again, uh, proactive, uh, reactive instead of proactive. Uh, and the fragility of the water system was demonstrated in 1954 when a 17-year-old girl ran over a hydrant and knocked it out uh, because she had a package in her seat that fell off onto her floor and she lost control of her car. Uh, and the hydrant uh, spilled 230,000 gallons of water. If there was a fire that day, the fire department would not have had enough water uh, to put it out. Uh, it seemed to be a habit of women drivers in situate because uh, three years later in the famous Welch fire uh, downtown uh, in the harbor, uh, the same thing happened. Uh, a young woman ran over the major hydrant uh, on First Parish Road. And uh, that's one reason why they had to put hoses in the harbor to try and put uh, the fire out. So if I had to give a, a picture of the water system in 1950s, for nine months of the year, there was enough water to supply the permanent residents. Uh, it was when summer came along that the town really had to struggle uh, to provide water for everybody. One solution was to build another standpipe or water storage tank, which most of you probably are aware of. It's out on Maple Street and uh, Pynchon Hill. And I don't have a picture of that one, sorry, it's in the book. Uh, oh no, it's over there on the right, sorry. Um, so, Citroën now has two, or actually three, because uh, Lawson Tower is still functioning uh, at this time. Uh, water storage tanks, which kind of uh, prevent it from completely running out of, of water. Uh, it's also necessary because most of uh, the wells are electric, so if there's a hurricane, as there were a few during this time, uh, electricity goes out, the wells can't function, and they depend on the storage tanks uh, to provide water while the, the power is up. All right, so they continue to lay pipe around town and it doesn't sound too exciting. The pipes are kind of like uh, an underground uh, street system. Uh, in fact, that's how they refer to Kent Street and First Parish Road and uh, Country Way, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because in larger volumes of water now being pumped, uh, the old six inch uh, cast iron pipes simply aren't uh, doing it uh, and they're going to have to replace them uh, with 10 or 12 inch or even 16 in some cases uh, pipes and they're now made out of something called transite or AC which stands for asbestos and cement. Uh, so during the 30s and 40s and 50s uh, the town is replacing the old cast iron pipes uh, with transite pipe and now we're replacing the transite pipe with different kinds of pipes uh, today. A lot of new hydrants needed because the fire equipment is modernizing and a lot of the hydrants uh, uh, need to be modernized to match up with the fire department uh, equipment and also very important uh, for uh, establishing fair water rates and keeping track of how much water is being consumed. The town is now uh, providing water meters uh, a little bit uh, at a time for free to its customers. Uh, and by the, the 1970s, almost everybody in town is going to have a uh, water meter. Okay. And then we get uh, a little administrative change. The water department is going to be uh, converted into the water division of the Department of Public Works, uh, which also includes. Uh, public grounds, uh, highway department, now put on the umbrella of the Department of Public Works. So technically it's the Situate Water Division, not the Situate Water Department. 1960s, there was a 10 year drought, with 1965 being the driest year on record uh, in Massachusetts. And at the same time this was happening for wells in town had to be shut down. Uh, two of them because of salt uh, and two of them because of iron in the water. Uh, it was this time the town got serious about looking uh, at the potential 
of a bigger surface water supply, uh, a reservoir. So in 1966, uh, they began to talk about designing a reservoir and a water treatment plant. They went to the town in 1967 and got a unanimous uh, consent from voters uh, to plan a, a reservoir and water treatment plant. Uh, the building of the reservoir and the water treatment plant, especially the reservoir, is not going to be an example of efficient, good town government because it's going to have all kinds uh, of problems. Uh, for one thing, uh, the reservoir was going to be at an elevated, uh, an elevation of 40 feet above uh, sea level. And there had been engineering and uh, other studies done as early as the 1920s for this. Uh, and the new engineers who were going to design and build a reservoir, help build a reservoir, uh, went by these 1920s uh, figures. Uh, but they soon figured out that if they built it uh, with a 40 foot elevation, uh, that it's going to flood significant amounts of land uh, of the abutters uh, to the reservoir. Uh, but they, it was too late to really change uh, the plants. Uh, there was a lot of finger pointing about whose fault that was. Uh, but the fact was there was going to be some land of abutters, uh, a fairly significant amount uh, that was going to be under 18 to 24 inches of water, especially uh, Bill Steverman and uh, Jim Springs properties. Uh, and the roads that they used to get to their property, uh, Elms Lane being one of them would be under two feet of water sometimes. Uh, when Mr. Spring in particular complained about this, uh, he went to the selectmen uh, meetings frequently, compared to selectmen meetings to uh, Rowan and Martin, a comedy show at the time. Uh, got so frustrated that he finally sent the uh, town uh, a bill for storing water on his property, which I think they actually might have paid him. Uh, the other kind of embarrassing situation was when the reservoir was filled up, the town had no access to the reservoir because all the town land was now underwater. And still today, uh, there's a phone number on the wall in the water treatment plant that the town has to call this resident to get permission to go through their property to get to the reservoir. Uh, and those beautiful stumps that you see, like right now when the reservoir is low, are not supposed to be there. The contractor was supposed to remove those stumps, and they obviously. Uh, weren't. Uh, they fired the contractor uh, before the job was finished. Uh, fined him $8,000 or $15,000. It was actually uh, a disagreement between the water department and the engineers about how much he actually paid uh, the town back for not uh, finishing the job and getting rid of the stumps. Uh, the stumps don't do any harm to the water, uh, but when the water is low, it doesn't look so great. Uh, and they just simply, it was too expensive to get rid of them at that time. The other thing is the, the contractor didn't really dredge the uh, reservoir properly. There's still a lot of aquatic plant life left, uh, which is going to create uh, a problem. Some of you got letters uh, in, a couple of weeks ago from the town about high levels of uh, the chemical trihalomethane, which uh, gets uh, increased levels when uh, the chlorine in the water uh, reacts with the uh, plant life. And because the reservoir is being used so much during this current water shortage, uh, there's a lot of uh, water uh, from the reservoir which needs to be treated with chlorine and thus the uh, trihalomethane issue uh, today. And the reservoir also was going to uh, inundate one of the most productive wells in town, uh, well number 21 in Wagner's Meadow. So they get a reservoir, but they also lose a, a productive well. And then there were cranberry bogs near the reservoir, uh, which had a lot of chemical fertilizer in them that was going to run into the reservoir water. So the town eventually had to build a runoff ditch, diversion ditch uh, for the cranberry bogs. But all this said, when the dust settled or the water settled, uh, in 1970, the town had a new surface water system uh, 
and a water treatment plant, $7,000 under uh, budget. And here's a great map. If you don't understand how this water system, service water system uh, works. So we've got Old Oak and Bucket Pond here and the 3A Rotary. More people familiar, if you're from out of town, there's a 3A Rotary there. There's a water treatment plant, which didn't have as many problems as the actual reservoir had. It had a few, but nowhere near as many. This is First Tearing Brook. This actually starts down here, runs through the pond, and it continues between the pond and in the old days, it kept going. There was no reservoir here. I understand from some old timers that some of the best trout fishing uh, in situate was in this area uh, where first uh, Herring Brook ran through the, the reservoir. And then across from 3A is a uh, tack factory pond. Every town around here was a tack factory pond because there were tack factories for the shoe industry in Brockton. Uh, and the way this worked, and here's more for Tearing Brook, uh, tack factory pond water uh, has a spillway when it's uh, full and the water flowing like in the springtime it goes into the reservoir when it gets low it stops and you will notice that the tack factory pond in droughts uh, doesn't empty out like the reservoir does because we just don't use it uh, the water from tack factory pond stops going into the reservoir so the reservoir uh, Water is goes over a spillway into First Tearing Brook and down into Old Oaken Bucket Pond. When the reservoir gets lower, which is usually from May to October, uh, it doesn't spill over, but there's a 16 inch culvert here where the water runs uh, into Old Oaken Bucket Pond. Uh, so that's the way it's supposed to work. Water goes from Old Oaken Bucket Pond to the water treatment plant. Any excess water goes into first Herring Brook into Herring River into the North River. So that's our surface uh, water system after 1970 when it's up and running. It was meant to be supplemental. Really, the reservoir was built to supply the needs of the summer residents again, uh, summertime. So it's a fragile system, even with the new addition. But at the time, people were talking about Situate's water problem is resolved for the next uh, 20 years. And here's a drawing of the water treatment plant because it's hard to get a nice picture of it. It's not a very attractive building. This is actually a more attractive drawing. Uh, this thing is ancient now. It needs to be replaced. We'll talk about it quickly later. Uh, and here's the uh, old oaken bucket in the uh, spillway and herring fish ladder, and here's the, the reservoir when it had lots of water in it. Okay, moving on, because time's flying. So when you get uh, service water, you've got to protect it. Now, so this is when the town begins to seriously consider environmental protection uh, because it's got this big service water system now. Uh, and with the increased use of the service water system, again, it needs to be protected. This is when the town begins to change its relationship with our, uh, environmental groups uh, like the North and South River Watershed Association and it's a kind of affiliate started by situate residents concerned about protecting uh, water, the first Herring Brook Watershed Initiative, who actually did a great job uh, with uh, funds and support from the NSRWA uh, uh, in discovering that there were more numerous tributaries to uh, the watershed than any of the other maps by the state or the town had shown, uh, which meant a bigger need to uh, conserve and protect the uh, property uh, in, in the watershed. Uh, fortunately, in the early 2000s, the state passed the uh, CPA, uh, Conservation Protection, Community Prote uh, Protected Act, uh, which, Preservation Act, excuse me, which uh, provides money uh, for uh, conservation land, for recreation uh, facilities, and for elderly uh, housing. Situate uh, made a wise decision uh, to become one of the first towns to uh, sign on to the, the CPA. Uh, and at the time, it was a big pot of money with few towns uh, 
uh, taking uh, their piece of the pie. So we got uh, a lot of money began fortunately buying up conservation land. There was also a the Maxwell Land Trust in town, which was uh, promoting conservation of, of land, especially in the west end of town where most of the watershed for the surface water supply was. Uh, and uh, with their uh, assistance uh, for landowners, they uh, taught them basically how to uh, turn their land uh, into conservation land and the town uh, supported that. Almost every time the town uh, came for CPA funds, the uh, town meeting approved them. Uh, so the Maxwell Trust uh, ended up uh, preserving hundreds of acres of, of land, mostly again in the, the West End. The town also began to pass bylaws to protect uh, surface water supply uh, by creating uh, protected zones. Uh, and it's also time, uh, thanks to cooperation, especially with the North and South River Water Association, uh, that the town begins to uh, seriously consider water restrictions, uh, which they had done in emergencies before. Uh, but as you can see from this sign, uh, which are up permanently now in different parts of town, uh, first in 2011, then 2015, the town is going to uh, establish a water restriction policy, uh, which from May 1st to September 30th, there is no watering between the hours of 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And the big thing is that there's a restriction put on lawn irrigation systems, which can now only be used one day a week, depending on what precinct you're in. Uh, amazingly, uh, it led to a 30% decrease in water use in the town during the summer. Uh, it also was gonna help preserve uh, herring, uh, hopefully, uh, or at least bring them back. Uh, also, uh, the town, site also gets involved in a uh, water conservation problem, a program called Greenscapes, uh, which they uh, have a link to on their website. website. All right, into the 21st century quickly. Uh, kind of like the 50s, a, a, a uh, contest here between development and keeping the town's character. Uh, and this was gonna to lead to some moratorium campaigns on, on uh, development, uh, or at least try and get moratorium campaigns on uh, development, uh, the most recent one being 2019. Uh, but there had been uh, planned uh, attempts at moratoriums in the 1980s and also in 2004. And a 2016 drought was also going to get people's uh, attention. And here's a cartoon from Matt Brown about uh, moratorium and here's the 2016 reservoir i rode by there today it doesn't look too much different in 2020. now in the early 2000s situate is going to have to apply for a new water management permit a lot of people don't understand uh does the state that controls how much water towns and cities can withdraw uh, and use. And in the, by the, by 2000, uh, Situate was looking at a situation where if they didn't get a water management permit that would allow them to withdraw more water, they were not going to be able to do much development in the town. They simply wouldn't be allowed to have enough water for additional development. Uh, so this kind of, uh, made them more uh, eager to join up or team up with uh, some of the environmental groups like the Watershed Association, which wanted to provide uh, more water uh, and improve uh, stream flow in streams to uh, bring back the herring uh, in Old Oak and Bucket Pond and hopefully in the reservoir and in the uh, streams. So uh, the town which had kind of an adversarial relationship with some of these environmental groups, especially when the uh, Watershed Association sued them for $70 million over the dumping of untreated uh, sewerage into the uh, Herring uh, River and into the North River, therefore, uh, they didn't have a very good relationship, but uh, 
that was going to change. And also because they had a new uh, DPW uh, superintendent, uh, Al Banger, who was interested in cooperating with the environmental groups. Okay, so we got water restrictions, which are still in place. And in the 2000s, we also had the issue of brown water. Um, brown water to me is kind of a symbol of the problems that the town has uh, because its causes uh, are related to some of the uh, issues that we've talked about uh, throughout the talk. So this trihalomethane issue uh, was one of the issues associated with brown water. Uh, iron from the old cast iron pipes was part of the brown water issue. Uh, manganese from the groundwater in the wells uh, was an issue, uh, especially certain wells uh, like well 17A. Uh, and the fact that the town uh, had deferred maintenance on their system uh, and never flushed water mains. And it was kind of a catch-22 situation they'd found themselves in because they needed to make sure that the reservoir filled up during uh, the non-summer months so that there would be enough water in the reservoir uh, for the summertime. Uh, and so in the fall, they had to make a decision after summertime whether there was enough water to flush the water mains and there usually wasn't. So for decades, the water mains never got completely flushed. They should be flushed every year or two. Uh, and for the first time in 2019, first time in decades, the town was able to uh, flush water mains and it's gonna contribute to the decrease in uh, brown water. So deferred maintenance was a problem. They were also afraid if they started flushing uh, water through these old pipes, that the pipes would break. Uh, so they, they paid uh, for the lack of maintenance with uh, uh, brown water issues. And the other problem was people complain about water rates today, but Situate actually has some of the lowest water rates in the area, uh, which meant they really didn't have a lot of money to maintain the system and do the maintenance that they needed to do. So again, it's kind of symbolic of all these problems coming together with the brown water issue which is gonna peak, as many of you know, in 2018 and 19 is a famous meeting and the high school auditorium, 400 people with the selectmen there uh, and the engineers that the town has hired, Ty and Bond, uh, there to explain the water issue. Uh, and at that meeting, uh, they not only described the causes, but came up with some solutions. Uh, get rid of the cast iron pipe. Uh, so the town is going to uh, over the next few years uh, spend, or have been actually already removing 22 miles of cast iron pipe. Uh, that was completed, I believe, last year. Uh, they were able to flush the pipes for the first time in 2019. And then there's this new method of cleaning up pipes called ice pigging, which you've seen uh, signs of the electronic signs when you go to the dump sometimes to see that the ice pigging is going on. They've ice pigged 81,000 feet uh, of pipes. Uh, they are renovating wells to get rid of the uh, manganese. Uh, currently well 17 of a tech factory road. We're spending $8 million putting in green sand filters. Hopefully that's gonna be up and running in the springtime to uh, help us get out of the current water shortage we have. Uh, searching for new sources, the Dolan well field. With the Dolan well field, the town purchases property in 1993. It's between uh, Hollis Street and Captain Pierce Road behind Country Way. Uh, they did some testing there in the late August or early September. The results haven't come back yet. They're hoping in three to five years that this well field will yield anywhere from 300,000 to 500,000 gallons of uh, water a day. Uh, we'll see. Uh, and in Hammerock, which is one of the uh, biggest problems for what's called uh, unaccounted for water, water that uh, the difference between the water that the town knows it pumped and the water that uh, gets used. Uh, the biggest 
problems for of un, uh, accounted for water is in Hummer Rock because of the, the pipe situation there. So improve the infrastructure in Hummer Rock, which they're working on too. All right, no more brown water. So there is a, a current plan. Uh, let me just go back to this. Uh, something that's been lacking for years, finally. Uh, the town realized it had to come up with a master plan for uh, dealing with water strategically. And the plan includes raising the reservoir a foot and a half uh, to provide like 25% more uh, water, 25 more days of water. Uh, it also will help herring uh, survive and be able to get out into the, back to the ocean in uh, the fall if that, uh, water can be uh, used to improve uh, stream flow for the herring to get back out into uh, the ocean. Uh, the, a new water treatment plant, which is desperately needed. One of my biggest fears, uh, and I think the engineers at the water treatment plant uh, go to sleep at night wondering if a piece of equipment breaks uh, that they can't replace because this water plant was built in 1969 and they don't make some of these parts anymore. In 2019, they did uh, some emergency repairs, but uh, desperately need a new water treatment plant, uh, which will take, even if we decided to do it today, uh, it's gonna take five years to complete that. Uh, but that's uh, part of the master plan. We need another water storage tank or uh, uh, standpipe. Uh, and we need to continue with the water smart and the greenscapes uh, conservation practices. Uh, and water restrictions uh, and uh, our tiered water rates are another way that we can conserve water. Uh, people complained about the, I think it was 20% increase in water rates in 2018, but that's necessary to pay for some of this uh, maintenance on the system and improvements. All right, that gets us to today, the pandemic, perfect storm. Summer started in situate as far as water use was considered this year, I think in April. Uh, you've got uh, people home from colleges when they close down work, uh, summer residents, people who have summer houses or second homes uh, decided they could work remotely from those. So I think most of you who lived in town noticed the big uptick in the population uh, in April. By June, you were getting phone calls from the water division that we're using 20% more water uh, in June uh, 2020 than we had in 2019. And uh, the water treatment plant was running at full capacity. Uh, we had uh, a well down. In fact, we have two wells down, 17 and 18, they're for, to be re repaired and to eliminate manganese. Uh, hopefully those are gonna be back up running in the spring, but right now they're down uh, and we have a drought. Uh, it's getting pretty close to the five months of uh, limited rainfall that 2016 drought had. Uh, and I did check before I did my talk with Sean Anderson at the water department, uh, water division. The reservoir is down 74 inches and it's 26.78% uh, at capacity. In, 19, in 2016, it was a 21 uh, capacity. When it gets down to 15, we have a deal with Cohasset. Uh, we have an interconnection with Cohasset that is available if we need uh, to use it. We didn't need to use it in 2016 and hopefully we don't have to use it uh, this year. So, it's fragile water system. And uh, sorry for the length of this, but it's a lot of information. So now, uh, there's some uh, websites that you can uh, get more information. The, the town water division has some good information. The town's water resources commission and the North and South River Watershed Association has a lot of stuff about the restoration of First Tearing Brook. And if you want to order the book, get a lot more detail. Uh, Simplest way, I think, is to go to blurb.com, uh, type in uh, Old Oak and Bug as your search, uh, 
and again, you can, uh, it's a way to contribute to the historic society who gets a share of the cost of the book. All right, questions. I'm supposed to do chat now, right? Stop share. Thank you, Jim. That was- Sorry for length, hopefully everybody is not asleep. Oh no, that was quite interesting. Um, let's see, I believe we have, um, wondering when Well 20 was built. Well 20. I'm going to have to look that one up. Okay, give me the next question. I'll look for that in a second. Because I can't answer that immediately. I don't want to. Okay, well, you know what? Why don't you go on to, um, is, it, is there anyone else who has? Oh, I have the answer. 1950, oh, there you go. 1958 is the Fitz well. There's still a well there. It's capped and there's the, the pump is not working. You can, there's a little uh, cul-de-sac you can drive down where Fitz Mills used to be. If you interested. <laughs> okay, great. Um, is there anyone else who has a question before we head into the email questions that came in? Oh, Bobby Cheshire. He has got, if you can see, he's holding it up right now. I'm going to wait a minute. I'm going to spotlight you for a minute. There's Bob All right. Cheshire. All right. All right. You've got a, it's an Egypt or a, a Beaver Dam? Beaver Dam. Beaver Dam, yes. All right. Hold and, on to it. <laughs> <laughs> also, I have an interesting story, Jim. My father was public grounds, and uh, he went down to uh, Wagner's Meadow, I guess the old pumping station, the well. Yeah. And that's where you could find pitcher plants, which I guess are kind of rare. That's the ones yeah. with the spikes when the bugs go in, they can't get out. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's the one that I got inundated by the reservoir. Right. Yep. Yes. Awesome. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah, I have one more question. Why, why don't they dredge Greenbush Pond? Wouldn't that make sense? Well, both of those are shallow. I mean, the argument, I don't know about Greenbush Pond or Old Oak and Bucket. Oak and Bucket, yeah. Anonymous. But the argument for not dredging the reservoir uh, is, and I'm not an engineer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that there's a layer of clay underneath the reservoir that if you puncture it, it's going to drain the water. Now, some people think that's a bunch of BS. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> but, well it seems like Greenbush Pond is sediment, so it's yeah. that's settled, and you can sell that. Yeah. That's actually the oldest recorded dam in the country is that dam. The, the one where the spillway is? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. Has the well, the private wells play in it? Well, I was looking at the desalinization. Okay, I I know it's been looked at, but I think it's always been looked at as being way too expensive. But that's just beyond my okay. favorite. <laughs> okay, um, what role do private wells play in the town's reserve of well, or access to water? Private wells can be somewhat controversial. There are a lot of people who think, uh, for example, that they should not get this by for water restrictions. Uh, I think the argument is that they're uh, dipping into the same aquifer. Um, although some of these wells, if they're really deep, uh, the, the deep artesian wells, they're getting, that water's coming from Canada. <laughs> uh, so what role do they play in the town's reserve? They don't play any, they're just uh, whatever individual landowners uh, decide to, to dig a well and put up their well water sign. Okay. Um, would tying into Quabbin Blue Hills MWRA be a viable option as a top off water source? Um, I don't know specifically if that's still possible. Um, every time they looked at it in the past, again, uh, it seemed to be too expensive and would take too much time to solve some water emergencies. Um, I, I mean, the, the 
to me, uh, I mean, the, the solution, the solutions offered about expanding the reservoir and keeping our fingers crossed about the well 17 being able to produce 390,000 gallons of water and the real big boost and the thing that I think the town is really hoping on is the, the Dolan well fields producing uh, those 300 to 500,000 gallons. If uh, between that and well 17, you're going to have another 600, 700,000 gallons of, of water available, which according to population estimates would provide enough water for the future. Because um, the, the estimates are the town population is going to level off at 18,000, maybe even dip down to 16,000 by 2050. Uh, so we would have adequate amount of water if the wells can get back up and be productive and the reservoir gets expanded. And do you know why well 20 is closed? Uh, that was a, I believe a salt issue. I don't know, that was an iron issue. Too much iron in the water. Okay. Now you, have you, all right, let me, um, do we need to buy water to drink and cook with until the reservoir goes up? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, there's, there's going to be adequate drinking water. Uh, and I mean, the, the reservoir, the dramatically dry reservoir with all the tree stumps is a little bit misleading. That's the um, lowest part of the reservoir. Uh, so it dries up. It's, I don't know, some places it's only three feet deep. I mean, the reservoir is not, I think it's 12 feet in the middle. Uh, so, but if you went to the, into the reservoir and stood up on the, the dam, uh, it wouldn't look as uh, dramatically dry as it, it is. But it is, you know, down to only 26% capacity. But I don't think we'll be at the point where we're going to have to buy water in bottles. I hope not. Unless the water treatment plant goes down. And I think that's it for the chat. Um, oh, isn't iron a... No, I, I'm not a chemist. <laughs> okay. okay. And answer that one. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and then you had a few that came in. You have those you were going to address? I thought I answered most of Bob Carson's questions. Uh, I don't know if he... I didn't even, I don't know if you attended or not. Um, Let's see if he's here. I he had one about Cohasset water, whether we had access to that. And we, we do if we need it. Uh, mm -hmm. but we haven't needed it yet. Um, so I remember what else he asked. Um, Whatever they were, I think I did answer them. Okay. If not, I can email them the answers. And if okay. he's not, it wasn't here. And my email address was on there. I hope on that last slide, I forgot to point it out. It's jaygalinski085 at gmail if anybody is interested in emailing me. jaygalinski at, I mean, jaygalinski085 gmail. All right, looks like we have one more here. At the water meeting in 2018, an engineer told us that what we need is deeper wells. Would give us um, plenty of Well, water. that's one thing they are doing with well 17, I know, because if you go deeper, it also eliminates the manganese uh, or helps because the manganese, I think, I forget. Again, I'm not an engineer. Uh, it's either 200 or 300 feet down, you don't, you stop getting manganese. Uh, I think also doing well 17 along with putting in green uh, filters and same thing with the uh, 18B, which is on the, actually on the old Boston Sand and Gravel property and now it's the golf course. Uh, those are two wells that are down at the moment because they're uh, trying to get rid of the mang uh, manganese. 
So, uh, okay. yes, probably, it's probably the tie in uh, the engineers that they've, uh, the company they've hired to do the uh, strategic plan. I believe they testified in 2000, tie in bond. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Or comment or anything you'd like to, if you'd like to, um, unmute yourself and no okay they're all going to have dinner like me <laughs> <laughs> nope they're all still here they're no all worries. still here yeah well thank you everybody who did attend and uh hopefully you don't yell at your neighbors about violating the water restrictions <laughs> yes thank you everyone for attending tonight and um we will see you back here, hopefully on uh, November 5th for, um, for our next presentation. And um, again, we are happy to um, offer these programs with no, um, no fee to anyone open to the public. Donations are greatly appreciated and much welcome. Again, PayPal, or you can mail something in if you'd like. Um, please do not feel obligated. Um, and please, everybody, remember to vote. Okay? Really and often. Yep. There you go. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Jim. You're welcome.